Hello, everybody. Welcome to our monthly Signs of Alt Protein seminar. I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Maya uh, Davidovich Pinhas, who is an associate professor at the Technion, um, the Israel Institute of Technology, where she heads the lipid and soft matter laboratory in the Department of Faculty of Biotechnology and Food Engineering. Um, the research that she does in her lab um, combines material science and engineering concepts towards the development of new soft matter systems for biotechnology and food applications. Um, more specifically, her research focuses on the structure, property, function, relation of soft matter systems. Excited to learn what that means. Um, combining lipid and water phases using X-ray diffraction, microscopy, thermal rheology, and texture analysis. Um, she earned her bachelor's in biochemical engineering and her master's and PhD in chemical engineering from the Technion um, in Israel and her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Guelph, which is one of the best food science um, universities in the world, concentrated on oil-based gels and termed oleogels. Um, so with that, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Maya um, to the stage to, to share her wealth of knowledge with us today. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us from around the world. So with all that, I will pass it over to Maya to share her screen and get us started. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. So I will share the screen. Hopefully it will go smoothly, yay. So uh, first of all, I want to thank the GFI for giving me the opportunity to, to teach you and to transfer some of the work that we're doing in the lab. Uh, I hope it will be interesting. And I guess that some of you, it's the mid of the day and some of you, it's early, late evening, like in my case. Uh, so I will try to make it interesting and enlightening as much as I can. So today I would, um, I will talk about a little bit about a lot actually about soft matter and more specifically on oleogels and other biphasic system. And this is like a process going like a research going uh, a story of how we promoted and how we managed to use all the knowledge that we obtained from the beginning until the end. And I hope it in the end you're going to see an video that I hope it will convince you that we are on the right track. If we look at this image, it's really clear that uh, most of you are familiar with what with the numbers we uh, we see here, and most of the of us understand and see the tremendous change that you can see around with the, all the investment of money on food tech company in general and on a uh, uh, plant based. Uh, products in specific. And if we look more specifically, you can see the colors. It's really uh, emphasizing the differences. You can see a large increase in investment on food take, food science, uh, and this is actually our com community. And if we think about it, the industry, the academia, as well as the government are trying to find new solutions for uh, growing problems in the world. But most of these attempts are emphasizing the need to answer the consumer, to focus on the consumer and what we're giving to our consumer. So we are talking about uh, various uh, uh, approaches or various aspects that we need to think about when we develop new food products. We're talking about, of course, food safety. Everyone knows that we need to provide safe food for the community. On the other side, we have to provide nutritional value. We have to provide good food for the community so we will maintain health and well-being. On the third uh, parameters, we have to think about what the community, what the consumer likes. If he likes it more soft, if he likes it more salty, sugar, whatever. And more recently, we can see a lot of consumers that are concerns about, concerned about sustainability. And if we think about sustainability and issue that related to sustainability, we immediately think about all the production of the alternative 
solutions. We're talking about alternative solution to all kinds of animal-based uh, products. And we can think about uh, fish, we can uh, fish replacers, we can think about meat replacers, uh, cheese, milk, egg, whatever you can think about that we will replace the use of animal-based products. So if we think about all these uh, product and we can see in the in the also in the GFI as well. There is a lot of concern and actually the main topic that everybody talks about is plant proteins. We can see a lot of research going on. A lot of companies trying to use new sources for protein. We think about algae, microalgae, insects, and all the legumes, etc. But all this work is emphasizing the need to replace proteins, the need to replace the proteins from animal, animal uh, product. But if you think about it, proteins are really, really important. But we have to remember that they are only part of the macronutrients that we need to consume. And we need to think about other products, other co component in our uh, nutrition that is essential for our development. And we have to remember again that although proteins are important and they have a, they have a very important uh, functionalities in our food, but they're only part of the big cake that you can see here. And therefore today I would like to emphasize and try, and try to convince you that we need to talk about other components as well. And today I will focus on one product, which are the fats and oils. Uh, fats and oils are really essential for our, although they have a very bad reputation, they are really essential for our physiology. They have high content of energy, although some people do not like to consume them and prefer to avoid them because of this uh, uh, property, but they are very crucial for our development and especially for kids' development. They have various roles in physiological systems like our brain, et cetera. And they're of course important to protect our inside and outside uh, physiologically. So it's very important to consume fat, although people think that fat is the problem. And actually it's not always we need to consume it, but consume it wisely. So if we look at the alternative that, that are out there today, we think about the uh, I would say replace plant-based, uh, replace animal-based product by plant-based product, you can look at these two images. I don't know about you, but I will definitely choose the left burger over the right one. Meaning that the, the right one consists maybe the amount of protein that we need in order to live and in order to flourish. But we have to remember that the fat inside this product does something. It has a specific role when we consume this product. And if we buy the hamburger on the right, I don't know about you, but I will not choose it again. I will not go to the shelf and pick it up again. Meaning that something the industry did was wrong and I didn't consume it again, I didn't buy it again. So it's very important that the fats that are inside this product have a very important textual attribute that is responsible for us liking this product as opposed to other products. So if we compare this product, for me, it looks like the right one lacks this juiciness that we're talking about, meaning it lacks the fat that we need in order to enjoy the hamburger better. But if we look at this fat, this fat is very crucial, first of all, because it, can, it creates some kind of texture inside uh, the product, but this texture is due to the hierarchy of the structure of the three acyl glycerols inside this uh, component. And these three acyl glycerols are mainly, usually mainly, uh, built of saturated fats. And if we go a little bit further, deeper 
into uh, the triacylglycerol structure and the structural hierarchy, we can see it here really clearly. The triacylglycerol organize in some kind of lamellar structure that further aggregate to form the three dimensional clustering that are responsible for the solid texture of fat, which is responsible for why we like the products with these components as much as we do. We think about ice cream, we can think about uh, hamburgers, we can think about buttery by itself. We have to think about that these structures are basically the main component, the main building blocks that creates this texture that we like so much. And that's why we consume high fat product usually. And if we think about nutritional perspective, we have to think about how each one of these fats and oils, what, how it, the, they affect our nutrition. We know it's already out there that we shouldn't consume such a, a trans fat. It's literally banned in some of the places around the globe and we shouldn't consume it. On the other side, we know, and it's already proved uh, by uh, researchers that we should consume mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids and they're good for our health. And these components are usually liquid at room temperature because, because they are high unsaturated fatty acids. But there is still a debate regarding the saturated fat. But everyone is, I would say, agrees that we should limit their consumption. We shouldn't eliminate it completely, but we should limit. So if we think about current health recommendation, we know that we should include good fats, meaning unsaturated fats, while on the other side, we should eliminate completely the consumption of trans fat. While on the, uh, the case of saturated fat, we need to limit their consumption. So if I'm summing up what I've explained up, to, explained up to now, we understand that we want to use, we want to consume saturated fat because they produce the structure that I've mentioned before. And that's how we get the solid texture and the nice texture that we like. But we need to consume the liquid, liquid oils, which consist high amount of unsaturated fatty acids. So what should we do? How can we, I would say live with ourselves and enjoy our time as well and enjoy the food that we eat. So if I'm asking that, that means that I have some kind of a solution and that's exactly what I'm gonna talk about today. So I will start my journey on my postdoc during my, uh, uh, during my time in Guelph University in uh, Canada. And actually that's why when I first introduced into the world of oleogels. Oleogels are oil-based gel, meaning that we are using liquid oil, which consists high unsaturated fatty acids. And we solidify the liquid oil using various small molecules or large molecules as well. So we are talking about gels made of 80 to 96% liquid oil, which is really good if we think about nutritional wise. And we're talking about system that has a very similar texture because it's really solid, similar texture to solid fat. So that means we are trying to, uh, I would say, minimize the gap between the liquid oils that I mentioned before and the solid fat. So as I mentioned before, why oleogels? Oleogels are uh, liquid and they have high amount of unsaturated fatty acids, which is good to our nutrition. On the other side, they have a solid texture similar to solid fat. So they have, the, maybe they, they usually have the functionality of saturated fats. But there's additional uh, uh, advantages to oleogels, which is we can offer some kind of additives to introduce additive into the uh, liquid form but that are usually hydrophobic and therefore we can implement additional health promoting ingredients into our system. So how can we produce these oleogels? 
it's very similar to how we produce gelatin gel. If we think about gelatin at home, when we produce it to our kids, the strawberry jelly or something like that, we're taking the powder, the gelatin powder, we take water, we mix it together, we heat it up uh, to certain temperature, and then mix it, make sure that our system is homogeneous, and then we cool it to room temperature. That's exactly what we're doing to produce oleogels. And when we produce this oleogel, we are using usually various molecules, small molecules, and they're usually derivatives of triacylglycerols or other lipid uh, components, and they can solidify. They're usually crystallizing inside the liquid oil. There are some polymers that can form uh, these oleogels using direct or indirect approaches, and I'm not going to uh, emphasize, and what I will not go over it uh, further in this uh, talk. So when we are producing this oleo gel, you can see here a variety of textures, color, a variety of mechanical properties, of viscoelastic properties, which are typical for a specific oil and gelator combination, meaning that we can play around with the system to produce the specific uh, texture or the specific mechanical properties that we are aiming for. And when we look at the oleogels that we can produce, we can divide the gelators, meaning the small molecules or the large molecules that gel the system, they can be divided into two main groups based on their molecular weight. On the one, one hand, we have the low molecular weight oil gelators, while on the other side, we have the high molecular weight oil gelators. And the beginning of the journey in my lab here in the Technion started with trying to formulate some kind of hybrid uh, system that combined various uh, gelators together. So the first uh, attempt was to try to implement, to combine a uh, high molecular weight gelator, which is ethyl cellulose, with low molecular weight gelator, which is lauric acid. As I mentioned before, usually tag derivatives are used as gelators by themselves because they can crystallize and you can see here in the image. And when we combined it together, we were able to formulate a new system with the characteristics of the polymer as well as the low molecular weight oil gelator, meaning that we can play with the mechanical properties of the system using this uh, combined system because ethyl cellulose usually produces uh, oleogels that are very viscoelastic, while on the other side, lauric acid produces uh, relatively soft oleogels. But when we combine them together, we can control this mechanical pro the mechanical properties of the system based on the combination. The next example will be combination of two small molecules. In this case, we try to use a uh, two different free fatty acids that has a very different uh, molecular chain length. On the other, on one side, we have the lauric acid with 12 carbon, and on the other side, we have the henic acid that has 22 carbon uh, chain uh, fatty acid. And we try to combine them together and try to see how uh, one affects the other. And we could see that the behenic acid is more significant, uh, uh, has more significant effect on the total behavior of the system. And we can see it's, uh, I would say, uh, some, are, some of the uh, properties of these two components. And when we combine them together, we can see that in the confocal images, we obtain not a large crystal, like in the case of the hennic acid or the feather-like uh, crystals, like in the lauric acid, but something in between. And when we try to analyze the thermal properties of this system, we actually, again, manage to obtain not just mechanical properties that combine these two systems together, but also, also thermal properties that uh, refer to each one of them. When we, when we look at the, uh, at the rheology properties of the system, we can see that the transition between uh, soft or liquid material to the solid material uh, appears at temperature, which is between the transition of each component by himself, meaning that we can control 
the, uh, I would say, melting behavior of the system just by combining two components that gel at different temperatures. And by that, we can obtain a new system with, uh, I would say, uh, combined melting behavior. Uh, the next step was to try to see how this system, oleogels, everybody's using these days oleogels. I can find so many publications on this topic and I get a lot of reviews on that. Everybody's working on oleogels, but how does oleogel digest in our bodies? So how, can, how do we consume it? And how are our bodies using the oils inside uh, these oleogels? And uh, in order to understand that, we did some kind of in vitro analysis of the lipolysis of uh, oleogels using different uh, oil gelators. And in this case, we decided to use different oil gelation with different mechanism of gelation, meaning that we have used low molecular weight oil gelation gelator where, where we use GMS, glycerol monosterol, and we used high molecular weight oil gelator, the ethyl cellulose, and we also used combination of beta cystosterol and gamma resinol in order to understand their behavior as well. And we did the analysis using the same concentration of gelator, and we wanted to see how they uh, break down in our intestine. And when we did the analysis, we were surprised to see that each gelator breaks that produces lipolysis profile very different from each other. Meaning that when we use ethyl cellulose, it's actually hindered the lipolysis of the oil inside the oleogel. Meaning that maybe we can produce a system with, uh, with hindered lipolysis, meaning that maybe we can reduce the fat intake that we consume during uh, while consuming this product? That's a question. Everybody can think about it different way. While on the other side, when you use GMS as oil gelator, we saw that actually it's breaking down in, uh, completely, which is comparable to uh, uh, the control which had uh, uh, oil by just oil. And we saw again that the combination of beta cytosterol uh, and gamma resinol behaves even, they, it's even harder to, uh, full, uh, uh, to break down the oil inside this oleogel even further compared to ethyl cellulose. So if we can produce oleogel that uh, I would say break down in our body in a different way, maybe we can control that. Maybe we can produce design oleogels that will, will break down in our uh, intestine in a different way. So in order to study that, we've chosen the, the, the uh, two oleogels, uh, two oil gelators that are very different from each other. On one side, we chose ethyl cellulose, on the other side, we chose the E471, which is mono and diglyceride combination. And we tried to analyze the lipolysis of these systems under in vitro conditions. And you can see them here, where we have the samples with only E471 on the top and sample with only ethyl cellulose on the bottom. But then we try to play with the ratio between these two components where the total concentration remain the same. And when we do that, we, poof, it looks really cool. We can control the breakdown of the oleogels in our intestine just by controlling the, the, uh, the concentration or the ratio between these two components. Meaning that we're not just, we can control a lot of parameters in our system just by playing around with the composition. As I mentioned before, we can control the thermal properties, meaning that the transition between solid to liquid, we can control the mechanical properties, and we also can control the lipolysis of this system. So after examining and studying oleogels, uh, a lot of different types of oleogels, I was starting to think maybe we should add another component to the system. Maybe we can add another phase to the system. I, up to now, I've been talking about oil phase, but maybe we can add 
something else. So as I mentioned up to now, we saw that oleogen is a really good solution to reduce the amount of saturated fat. But can we do a little bit more? Can we improve our system a little bit more? Can we reduce the amount of calories that we consume? How can we do that? Maybe we will add, as I mentioned before, add another phase to the system. And that's how I started to work with the phasic system. So we're producing lipid-based biphasic system that produces soft matter system. This way we can play around with the phases and the composition in each phase in order to control the properties of the final soft matter system. So we're talking about a system or a group of materials that are known as emulsion gels. We have two phases. It's either oil in water, in the case of whipped cream, or we're talking on water in oil, in the case of butter, meaning that we're playing with two phases with different, we can play around with the ratio of these two phases in order to produce a variety of products with variety of properties. So the first example that I would like to discuss today will be uh, the use of very specific uh, structuring agent. As I mentioned before, uh, the use of free fatty acids and monoglycerides is well known and there's a lot of research on that. On the other side, of course, using of triacylglycerol is obvious because that's what we have in fat, right? But less research is done on the use of deglycerides. Uh, actually, if you look at the chemical structure, they are really interesting because usually they, I would expect them to organize very similar in, in lamella, very similar to triacylglycerols, but they also have a OH group that are very available to other interactions and other behavior. And they're actually form uh, crystals in liquid oil, similar as all the other tag derivatives but they are also amphiphilic in nature and they can produce something on the interface of two phases. So the next uh, uh, study was to try to analyze and try to go in depth to the dual functionality of this molecule, diacylglycerol, to understand how diacylglycerol behaves in a biphasic system where we have a, a continuous oil phase and water inside this continuous oil phase. And we actually produce various formulation of this system and examine what we receive. And you can see here uh, the results of this uh, experiment, I would say. First of all, if we go to a high concentration of water, we can see that our system leaks. Uh, we didn't get a very good stabilization of the system. It's very important to emphasize that this system is only diacylglycerols, water, and oil. We didn't add any kind of surfactant to the system or any kind of structuring agent, and we just wanted to analyze the behavior of the diacylglycerols. When we go to lower concentration of uh, water, we obtain a very soft and un, not very stable as I would say, it's really easy to, it's really hard to work with this system. Uh, in the intermediate area, uh, the system was quite, it was quite good, but it's also, it was, I would say the texture was a little bit brittle and it was hard to work with, but eventually we saw that the, cons the, uh, uh, the composition that you see here was really good and we got a very nice smooth texture with, uh, with stability, with uh, interfacial stability where we didn't get any kind of phase separation. So actually we are currently writing the paper for this uh, work and we did a lot of analysis on that, but hopefully soon we will be able to uh, reveal all the results of this study. The next example will be actually something that we begin with, protein. Everybody's talking about protein. So why wouldn't we use protein in order to stabilize the oil phase? But as you know, proteins are really available. Everybody's using it. 
everybody wants to use it. It's really uh, good to our food label. Uh, but when we try to mix uh, uh, the protein with oil, not a very pleasant results, I would say. It looks really un, I would say, I wouldn't eat it, I wouldn't take it, I wouldn't use it. So that means in order to uh, implement protein into oil or stabilize the oil using protein, we need additional approach. And, and actually we managed to do that by using biphasic systems. The, actually the one phase was the oil and the other phase consists the, uh, the protein in it. And here you can see the results. Uh, what you can see here on the left, it's actually an oleogel with, uh, um, it was 90% oil, yes, 90% oil, and the other components are actually the protein and the other phase. And when we did confocal microscopy on this system, you can see here the oil droplet in uh, green, and the coverage of the oil droplet in red, it's actually the protein. And we, when we, de Im we did uh, electron microscopy imaging on the system, you can see that the, uh, the protein is actually organizing on the interface of the oil droplet by small, I would say, particles that aggregate on the surface. And when we analyze the mechanical properties of this system, we were surprised to see that they are thermoresponsive, meaning that by applying a thermal uh, ramp, I would say, or sweep, we can reduce the mechanical properties, meaning that we will melt the system and then reform the system by reducing the temperature, meaning that we can obtain some kind of melting I would say crystallization, but because they're not crystallizing, but uh, rearranging after applying, uh, after reducing the temperature. And we believe that what happens in the system is that the small aggregate of the proteins are connected uh, through hydrogen bonds. And when we uh, increase the temperature, these bonds are breaking down and therefore the system go uh, melts. But when we reduce the temperature, it, uh, the interaction reform. And when we actually did the same experiment using shear forces, we obtained similar behavior. When we apply shear on the system, it's breaking down and meaning that the mechanical properties reduces. But when we remove this, uh, uh, this stress, we obtain increase in the mechanical properties, meaning that the sample regain its uh, it's viscoelastic properties, and you can see it here. And we again think that this is because of uh, the particles uh, aggregates disassemble and reassemble after uh, removing the applied shear. So up to now, I talked about biphasic system, but I didn't specify the solvent that we are using, the other solvent that we are using. And because I've been working a lot during my PhD and my master with hydrogels, I thought maybe we should combine these two systems together and try to formulate something new. And actually, this is a new group of material that emerged uh, recently in the literature, which are a combination of oleogel and hydrogel, and we call them bigel, meaning that we have two gels combined together. And the difference between the various uh, uh, bigels that you can see in the literatures, uh, literature are usually either the composition that we're using in each phase, but also the preparation procedure that we're using in order to produce them. Some uh, mix the system as gels and some uh, liquefy each phase and then mix them together. So we're talking about big, uh, two phases that are gel, we can talk about oleogel in hydrogel, and we can talk about hydrogel in oleogel, where we can also find big continuous bigels. And the, uh, and the differences between these all three examples are usually based on the composition that we are using, the ratio between uh, the two phases that we are using. So the formulation of bigel in my studies are based on either 
uh, also in other studies, not just mine, uh, we're talking about hydrogel, where we have either polysaccharide proteins, fibers, etc. While on the other side, on the oleogel, we can talk about DAG derivative waxes, phytosterols, as I mentioned before in the earlier uh, session about the oleogels. But in order to produce a very stable biphasic system, we have to think about the interface as well, and therefore. We, we should add some kind of surface active agent like lecithin, sucrose ester, PGPR, et cetera. So how do we produce this system? We have two phases. Each phase is usually homogenized to, for, to dissolve uh, the structuring agent of, it, uh, of the phase. And then we're mixing the system together. And usually we have some kind of either homogenization or mixing stage where we mix the two phases together. And here you can see it's not a margarine. It's actually a bigel produced using some of our, one of our, uh, of our composition that we are studying in the lab. So the first, uh, uh, we try to understand the, the effect of various parameters on the final bigel behavior. And in this case, we analyze either the hardness of the bigels or the oil binding capacity of the bigel, which can refer to the stability of the bigels. And in this case, we analyze the effect of the mixing time, meaning how long do we homogenize the system together, where we have on one side protein and on the other side we have the oil, and the protein, of course, in water phase and the oil uh, with other components. And you can see here with the confocal imaging that when we, we use too, too short homogenization time, you can see the water phase in uh, green, which is usually the protein, and the oil phase in red, where we have the other structuring agent. And when we mix them for a short period of time, the mixing was not very good, and therefore the mechanical properties were not good, and also the, uh, the OBC. When we mix it for too long, we actually destroyed the network of the protein, and therefore the properties of the system were deteriorated. But when we mix it around three to five minutes, we obtain a very homogeneous system and that produces a very good Hardness, at the maximum hardness value as well as OBC. But it's important to emphasize that in order to study each system, each composition, we have to do this, we have to think about this. It's not the same for all systems, it depends on the, on the composition of the system that we're using. The next analysis that we've done, and we're hoping to uh, publish it soon, is the effect of mixing temperature. As we know, we can mix the two phases while both hot. We can mix them where they're both really cold and we can mix them in, in the intermediate temperature. And we saw that when we play with the temperature of the mixing, we can really affect the mechanical properties of our system. And you can see it here, when we mix uh, the system at 60 degrees C, we obtain a very grainy texture. But when we mix it at 30 degrees C, the texture was really smooth, but the final product was really, really, uh, I would say weak. But we managed to see that when we mix the system at 40 degree, at between 40 to 45 degrees C, we obtain a very smooth, but also a very firm uh, system, which is consistent and could be uh, used as uh, margarine replacers or something like that. Uh, the next step was to try to analyze the thermal behavior of our bigels. Uh, and we saw that when we uh, analyze the BSC as well as the temperature dependent uh, viscoelastic properties, we could see a, a very sharp transition between the behavior at low temperature and the behavior at large temperature. You can see the, uh, the image on the top where at large, at uh, small, uh, low temperature, I would say, uh, the behavior is really solid, but when we increase the temperature, uh, it changes its behavior and softens, melt uh, in the system. And when we look at the DSC, we can see that this can be correlated to the melting behavior of the system. And we believe that this is the melting of the oil phase, the 
oleogel phase in the system because the water phase usually don't have any kind of crystal or something that will melt during uh, the transition. As you can see here, we can correlate the DSC, the melting DSC, the onset of the melting behavior with the, um, with the melting inside the rheometer. We also analyze the viscoelastic properties of this system, and you can see the results here. We analyze the, and, uh, the, each phase by itself, and you can see on green, we have the oleogels. On uh, blue, we have the hydrogel phase, and we can see that they have a very different mechanical properties, but when we analyze the mechanical properties of the bigels, we can see that the bigels behave more like the oleogels, meaning the mechanical properties of the bigel is mainly control, controlled by the mechanical properties of the oleogels. We also analyze the, uh, the thixotropic behavior of these systems because it's really important for uh, lamination uh, applications that the, uh, the system will behave, will deform or break down uh, during lamination, but then regain its structure after removal of the stress, uh, the strain applied. So we, uh, we saw that in bigels, we obtained 87 to 95% recovery, while in the oleogels without the water phase, we didn't reach this high recovery ability, meaning that by applying this water phase into the system, the hydrogel phase into the system, we obtain a improved recovery behavior. So the bigel composition, how the bigel composition affect our general uh, uh, properties of our bigel, as expected when we increase uh, the uh, oleogel, hydrogel oleogel ratio, we uh, destroy the stability of the system, meaning that we can obtain a very stable system up to 50-50% uh, oleogel hydrogel. We can control the properties of the system by using uh, uh, various concentration of oil gelator, where we can increase the mechanical properties of the system by increasing the concentration of the oil gelator. As I mentioned before, the oleogel is a dominant. Uh, um, it's the dominant phase in the in the mechanical properties. We can also play with the with the gelator of the water phase. We can increase uh, the gel uh, the bigel uh, hardness by increasing the water gelation as well up to a certain concentration. Which above we didn't get any kind of additional enhancement. And we can also affect the behavior of the system by using emulsifiers. And again, we can uh, obtain enhancement in the mechanical properties up to certain concentration. If we talk about emulsifiers, we can also play with the HLB value of the emulsifier, where in this case, we examine uh, various sucrose esters uh, where they have various uh, HLB value by uh, uh, where we can apply into the sucrose a uh, various amount of esters um, around it. And you can see that on the right, we have monoesterified sucrose ester, while on the other hand, we have fully esterified sucrose ester. We have eight position, position to esterify the sucrose ester. And by applying various ratio between these two components, we can change the HLB of our system. And you can see here, we uh, use uh, HLB1, which is fully esterified sucrose ester, HLB2, which is very similar, and HLB6, that it has only 70% fully esterified sucrose ester. And we were very surprised to see interesting result that when we have, uh, we use the HLB6, the droplet of the oil were uh, uh, the droplets, sorry, of the oil were uh, larger compared to the case of the lower HLB value. And we think it's related to the size of the sucrose ester uh, that go into the interface and how it occupies the interface. The last example of today, and I hope it will, it will enlighten you, 
is a very relatively new uh, development in our lab where we were able to produce a one pot uh, plant-based lipohydro system where in this case we have used two phases again but in different uh, I would say different combination and different uh, technology uh, and we were able to produce a very nice texture with a very high protein content, although we're talking about protein, uh, plant protein. And when we analyze the structure of this system, you can see it here, we have the oil droplets uh, on the left and where you can see it on the right side of this image, this is actually protein network that surrounds the oil droplet, meaning that we are able to produce a very stable, um, uh, system, lipohydro system, which has a very high protein content, it behaves really similar, uh, I would say, to solid fat, or you can imagine how, what this uh, product looks like. And actually, we were debating between ourselves how this product looks like, and we tried to fry it as well, and you can see the frying was really nice, and we have a very uh, a nice crust on the surface. And we uh, actually, the student in my lab started to think about what can we do with that? How can we use it? And there were a lot of ideas around, playing around. We can talk about cheese replacers because we're talking about very, very high concentration of protein and very high concentration of fat. We can think about this as a meat replacer by itself because it has a very high content of both component and fat replacers. And we, again, we can play with the composition really, really nicely in order to produce these uh, systems. The last example is actually using uh, the new technology in a system where uh, it's actually a funded research by GFI. It's finished like, I think a year ago, where we try to combine, we try, uh, I would say, combined forces here in our department, where uh, Professor Makhlouk, she is an expert on tissue engineering, and we have Professor Fishman, expert on enzymatic processes, and we have two students, Mr. Frankian and Giovanna, that a postdoc here in our department that we join forces in order to produce cultured meat with the fat inside, plant-based fat inside, and we were able to produce a nice prototypes. I know some of them are not very convincing, but I'm sure that the last image will convince you for sure, I hope so. And I think these prototypes are, have very good um, I don't know how to say potential to succeed in the future, but I'm sure that this image will convince you. I hope so, because I think these burgers have, it's actually cultured meat with uh, the fat inside. It really looks like a burger. And actually, Marcel actually tried it. And she said, it's tasty. Of course, there's a lot of work to do and we're just in the beginning but I hope it convincing you that all the journey that we have taken from the oleo gels uh, back in the beginning, all the way to what we're doing right now, it's really promising. It has a lot of potential uh, to be used in real application in the food industry. And I'm open to any suggestion from the crowd, uh, from anyone in the community who is interested in something like that uh, to do some kind of collaboration because I'm really into that. And with that, I would like to, of course, thank you for staying here, to coming here and to listening to whatever I have to say. And of course, all the funding agencies that helped me do all this journey uh, through the years. And most importantly, to my research lab that they are responsible for everything that I do here and they are doing the, the really hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Maya. That was an extraordinary seminar. Um, I, I have to commend you on what a powerful science communicator you are. Um, I think hydrogels and oleogels um, are, and emulsifiers are, are concepts that I've um, have kind of been 
mystifying to me um, in the past. And, and you just explained things so clearly. Um, I am totally bought in on the potential um, <laughs> of the- <laughs> The next um, GFI, I'm applying, okay. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much again for sharing your research with us. Um, it's really um, been a joy and an honor to learn from you. Um, so we can stop sharing your screen now. Um, and then, yeah, there's your whole face. Fantastic. Um, now we're pivoting over to the Q&A section. So for those of our audience members, um, who sat through Dr. Maya's presentation. If you have any questions, um, this would be a great time to drop them into the Q&A bar um, in your Zoom screen, um, and we'll get to them in due time. I know a few questions have already flown in here. Um, so I did want to start um, by asking, let's see, these two questions seem connected. Um, the first question is, asking how you can dec decrease the temperature of heating um, from mixing oleogelators in oil. So in general, uh, the temperature that we're using in order to, uh, to form this oleogel, it depends on the, the, the physical properties of the oil gelator that we're using. Meaning that we were using uh, waxes, a certain type of wax, it will uh, gel at the temperature that it ha it, it's originally uh, crystallizing or melting. So it's really related to the properties of the oil gelator. We can change it. The only way is by changing the system melting is by combining various gelators in order to try to, to aff one affect the other. Mm. <clears throat> Um, and so after an oleogel, not a bigel, melts, does the gel system reform during cooling? Yeah, yeah. It's really thermoreversible. Oleogels behave. Uh, um, oleogel without the water, it's really easy because like in margarine, when we melt them, the water phase will come out eventually and we will not be able to reform it. But in the case of oleogels, because we have only one phase, it's really easy to, it's uh, melting, crystallization, melting, crystallization. We can do it, uh, I would say uh, indefinitely <laughs> <laughs> until the oil is oxidized completely. Mm. Um, one attendee, David, is wondering whether you can help illuminate whether there are um, kind of commercial food products um, already available on the market that use oleo gels. Okay, I have to say that the food industry are, are really, really secretive. <laughs> they don't tell anything. I don't know about oleo gels that are used in the market. Uh, mm -hmm. I personally, I have project with industry in order to implement this idea in order to put it inside uh, the industry. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with any kind of product that it's out there. Mm -hmm. But there's um, a lot of research going on on that. Yeah, um, so that's, that's very helpful. Um, I am really curious because you spoke so eloquently about um, the kind of textural and kind of functional and nutritional benefits of using oleogels, um, especially in, in a lot of what we're trying to build here, um, alternative um, meat products. Um, I, I am sold on the opportunities there and I'm curious if um, you could share your perspective on what challenges um, oleogels might present as we look to um, build more compelling alternative protein products at scale? Right now, I, 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 th I think the first challenge will be the, the issue of oxidation. And uh, because oils are uh, sensitive to oxidation, so we will have to think about how we produce these uh, components with avoiding this oxidation. Mm. And this is the first thing. And actually, the second thing that I can think of is the is the industry itself. <laughs> I, I sense that there is a lot of, uh, I know that there is a lot of uh, uh, also startup companies that are starting to work on that. So uh, the only thing is that they need to connect. 
because mm -hmm. if you think about the project that we had here by connecting between two experts, one on uh, cultured meat, the other on oleo gels, it was easy to find the solution. Yeah. But usually startup company are uh, expertise on one topic. It's either uh, fat or cultured meat or a plant-based product, fermented product, whatever. So it's it's really if if they if if a company is uh, try uh, we will open to do collaboration between startup companies. It will be it will go it will get there much faster. Yeah, I love that. Just the call um, for greater cross-disciplinary collaboration, but also cross-sector collaboration, um, whether um, academia or, or industry and nature. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to need all of those connections in order to actually get to a better food system um, and, and to really tap fully into the power of oleogels. Um, there is a question here from Joshua, and I think that maybe the nature of this question is almost regulatory in nature. Um, they're wondering whether um, food products developed from oleogels and bigels are, um, are edible. Um, or are there any regulatory hurdles that, that you um, know of um, that, that get in the way of widespread adoption of oleogels? Or is it just a matter of really still from the foundational science perspective, understanding, um, yeah, understanding their potential. I would have to say that it's so easy <laughs> because uh, actually the oleogels are made of, I go to the supermarket, buy box of uh, oil, all the counters are looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> That's literally what we're using. We're using oils and usually the structuring agent is usually food grade meaning that we're using something that it's already approved. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't think that oleogel need any further regulation with respect to that. Um, and usually all the compo components are out there. I would say the, the know-how, the knowledge is behind what to put with whom. Mm. And that's what's so special about what we're doing in the lab because we understand how we can, uh, what kind of uh, structuring agent we can use in order to produce specific uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. So this is the main know-how uh, because everything is out there. That's why uh, I have to be honest, I can write a patent on that because it's not mine, it's out there. That's why we don't have patents in here unless, except for the last slide that I showed that we do have, but uh, all the others are really open because it's really out there. Even ethyl cellulose is a grass material, meaning that we already consume it, mm. and consume it in our food. The only regulation is related to how much. So there is, it depends on the country. We have some regulation of how much we can uh, put in food, how much sucrose ester, how much ethyl cellulose. So there are some regulation, but we don't have re uh, restrictions in general to use oleogel as far as I know. Got it. Super exciting. Um, there's a question here from an attendee asking, can it be added oleogels during high moisture extrusion? Um, and if it's incorporated in the matrix of high moisture meat analogs, um, do you think that would then slow down the rate of oxidation? This is my next project. Don't steal it from me. <laughs> Actually, we just bought an extruder uh, and we're waiting for it. And this is exactly what I would like to try. Uh, yeah, I am, uh, it will be the first small extruder here in Israel. So I'm excited it will arrive. Wow. And uh, actually, that's exactly what I'm aiming for. Um, we're thinking about to implement all your gels into, uh, into the extruder line in order to see how they will behave. I don't know about oxidation, but it because it was not really studied how the shearing and the high temperature inside the extruder will affect the oils, but that's why we are here. We have a lot of work to do in the academia, and this is one of it. I, I, one <laughs> of the 
Wow, that is super exciting. And I can't wait to follow the progress of that research and, and read whatever publications emerge from it. Um, there's a question here from an attendee around whether you think the scalability of oleogels will be difficult. Actually, we, we had a trial, not a trial uh, pilot plan, but we had a, uh, uh, we met company that is uh, producing margarines here in Israel, the biggest producer here uh, in uh, for margarine. And we came to the, uh, to their factory and we, we discussed it and it seems like it's doable. I never mm -hmm. tried it yet, but I think it's doable. And they think it's your doable, which is more important. Yeah. Now we need the funding to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, that is very, very exciting. And the fact, um, I mean, your reflection from earlier that all of these ingredients are already food grade, um, I think will will mean that it's much easier to bring this all to commercial reality um, than if that were not yet true. So very, very exciting and promising line of research. Um, if there are any other questions um, that you have for Dr. Maya today, please do add them in the chat. Um, because I think that was the last audience submitted question. Um, I think you did such a good job of answering everyone's questions, Dr. Maya, during the presentation itself, <laughs> that um, there are a few remaining. Um, but with that, if there are no other questions coming in from the audience, um, I would love to ask you, Dr. Maya, if um, there are any last um, thoughts you'd like to leave our audience with. Um, obviously, this is a community of scientists across the globe um, who are all um, singularly committed or curious about um, what they can do to build a better protein supply. Um, and the work that you're doing is, is so central to that. So um, is there anything you'd like to leave our community with before we I, I wait? The main topic is what actually I've been answering before, collaboration, mm -hmm. interdisciplinary. That's that, that's the way we will find the solution. That's what I think. The only way to find solution uh, for this issue to, to provide good products that will be bought from the shelf and eaten instead of burgers, uh, animal-based burgers, eggs, cheese, whatever is to combine forces and try to do it together. Yeah, I love that. Um, such a galvanizing call to action. Um, if folks are interested in collaborating with you, Dr. Maya, where can they reach you? Is LinkedIn a good platform? Uh, the, uh, uh, I would recommend just email. Awesome. In that case, we will drop your email. Yeah. Um, to those of, of you who are interested in collaborating. Um, and again, we really look forward to following um, additional lines of inquiry, um, your additional research um, that pursues, especially um, on the high moisture extrusion side of things. I'm excited to learn more. Um, we look forward to seeing everybody again um, next month for our monthly Science of Alt Protein Seminar Series. And thank you again from the bottom of our hearts, Dr. Maya, for joining us and for being so generous with your wisdom and insight. Um, thank you very much, Emmy, and I hope to, to hear from all of you soon on my email. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Bye, -bye.